what are we using, and maybe spark some interest uh, from the community to contribute. Uh, so everything starts with a patchwork. Uh, patchwork is a patch tracking system. It's open source. Um, it makes the patch management process easier for maintainers. Um, after you configure it for your subsystem, um, and like in our case, PPF, all patches that submitted to BPF at VGER will appear on the patchwork net dev BPF list. There, it will show status of each patch that we tested. Uh, it knows how to collapse patches from the series uh, into one entity, uh, and it can be enabled for any Linux kernel subsystem, and in fact, many already did enable it. So for example, uh, for BPF, you can see the list of patches, uh, and you can see that like some of them have, oh, sorry. Some of them have warnings, some of them failed. Warnings are usually coming from the, some net dev tests, but uh, BPF tests are usually passing. Um, if we we'll open the individual test, uh, sorry, individual patch, you can see that like it knows if it is part of the series, and it also knows uh, which tests uh, succeeded, which tests failed which is pretty awesome and hopefully useful for maintainers. Um, this is the list of like small subset of kernel subsystems that already uh, onboarded to patchwork. Uh, here you can see NetDev BPF, there is XFS devil, and many, many more. So, but what is a black box that actually takes a patch from patchwork and does all the magic, right? And this is uh, kernel patches daemon. So kernel patches daemon um, is a service that's implemented in Python. It's currently hosted on the meta infrastructure. Uh, it tracks and identifies new BPF patches in the patchwork BPF section. It creates pull requests to GitHub um, to kernel patches uh, BPF repo it merges GitHub actions on top of it. Uh, and uh, once test complete, it will fetch the results and post it to the patchwork. So this is how a pull request actually looks. So, so for this patch series, it has four patches. It adds CI files on top of it. So it will create it into five. Uh, and it submits it for merge uh, into the kernel patches BPF GitHub repo. Um, and if we look into the kernel patches VM test, this is a basically the commit that goes on top of the patches series. Uh, it has this .github directory that is doing all the magic. Uh, inside it has like step definitions, uh, how to execute, like what to do, how to execute tests, everything. So we added kernel patches VM tests and kernel patches BPF repos. Um, so what is kernel patches BPF? It just uh, GitHub repos that mirrors BPF next and BPF uh, Git repositories from kernel org periodically, right? And once PR is created in this GitHub repo, GitHub will start executing tests uh, defined in VM tests. Uh, repository. And yeah, this is just a screenshot of kernel patches BPF. It's just regular kernel tree, nothing special, no magic. But where we actually execute all these tests, and uh, these tests are actually executed in GitHub action runners. Uh, we are using self-hosted Git GitHub runners. Uh, we currently support two platforms, x86 and S390 uh, to test NDNS, right? Um, but we can obviously add more architectures and like, if we had cross-compilation supported, 
what we discussed with Dave yesterday, right? We can uh, build things on x86 runners and execute them in architecture-specific VMs. So that way we can support pretty much any platform. Um, GitHub runners, they pull work from GitHub, build kernel, build self-tests, and start the QM to execute everything. Uh, this is a screenshot from the uh, runners page. You can see that for x86, we use AWS instances. Uh, for IBM, we use IBM Cloud instances. They all regis register it. We can control them. So transparent and convenient. Uh, so what we actually run, we run a regular BPF te uh, self-tests. Uh, in particular, we run test procs, test maps, and test verifier. And we run two flavors of test procs. Uh, one is regular and one is no ALU32. So this is an example of successful run. You can see that we have four tests executed, all is passing, all awesome. Uh, this is an example of failed run. Uh, test maps failed. We posted error here. And so maintainers have a pretty strong signal about if a patch has any issues and can direct a uh, submitter if any issue happened. So what is next? Uh, we have lots of ideas how to improve the system. Uh, we want to add user space and kernel space sanitizers. Uh, we want to support Clang build. Uh, currently, Yong Kong fixes all Clang issues uh, if they occur. Thanks a lot, Yong Kong. Um, we want to add ARM64 uh, platform. It should be pretty easy with AWS Graviton instances. They're available. We can just add them to the infrastructure. Um, we also want to extend BPFCI support for other Linux subsystems. Uh, some obvious candidates is BetterFS with XFS tests or RCU with RCU torture tests. Uh, this is just to um, add more weight to what Joseph mentioned yesterday, right, during the Lightning talks that all maintainers will benefit from it. Um, we should also continue adding new BPF self-test and uh, iterate on BPF test procs infrastructure to make it more usable and you know to, to be more convenient. And one thing that will benefit almost everyone is to make CI executable from local machine. So even before you send the patch, you can actually initiate the run, get the results, and you'll be pretty confident about your patch going to the maintainer for the review, right? Have you, um, so we, we have some CI tests that run like nightly on BPF Next um, that do like longer running tests. So we run like NetPerf and then we attach a bunch of programs and stuff. Um, would that, we would we consider adding that to something like this? Or, or do you wanna just keep it like to these unit tests, basically, these so level stuff. So this uh, system, uh, it tests patches uh, that weren't applied yet to the tree, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what you are saying, if I understand correctly, is testing the tree yeah. nightly, like after patches already mm -hmm. landed, mm -hmm. right? So we currently don't support it, but we can definitely add it. I'm not sure if it will be through CI or not. Uh, sorry, through GitHub or maybe so, only. So we have like on GitHub, we basically have a, like a nightly job that runs out of the GitHub jobs. Mm -hmm. And then it, it runs kind of these longer running tests to make sure that we didn't break. You know, at some point during the day, some patch wasn't applied that broke something, but you know, wasn't detected at a unit test, only breaks when it's running for whatever, you know, long running networking stress test or something. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's something we could contribute if it's interesting. Yeah, how long are you uh, Not so long. I mean, like, minutes? Minutes. we have some that run for minutes, and then we have, like, one longer run that we run on, like, Sunday or something, right? Like, runs for, like, overnight or something. Yeah, so one problem is that, like, 
all this is run for every single patch set on every revision. Right. And also, whenever we update the BPF next or BPF, right? So like all that is re-triggered like once we land some patch, right? The, so if it like runs one hour, then like we just don't, no, well, we can have a lot of workers, right? That will run it, no, but like no, it will like, be very expensive. We trigger it like on nightly, like a nightly test. I just. We, we could, yes. Yeah. So like, I, I think it all will be or is already configurable, right? Like which tests are running where. Yeah. We, you didn't mention, right? Like we have the BPF and BPF next baseline tests as well. So like we have like two fake PRs mm -hmm. with like no patches. It's just like they are testing BPF and BPF next. Yeah. Uh, so we could add those long running ones uh, yeah. uh, there. Whether it comes from like the kernel sources or from outside, kind of secondary, though it would be probably easier if it's contributed to the self tests. So I think like at least every time I saw like nightlies, the way they're used is by people who are playing a catch up. Like in this case, you're you have your Cilium stuff. It's not part of this CI. That's why you have to do it nightly. That's why you test after it's got merged, hoping that, well, you catch all this regression quickly. But instead, if you could contribute Cilium test in whatever capacity, either upstream to self-test or to this VPFCI, your need to run nightly will be greatly reduced. Of course, we'll so, run it for you. Yeah. So we use something already very similar to this uh, on the Windows side, too. And there, what we run nightly is things that are very low probability of catching something but take a long time, right? And so if it takes a long time and there's like less than a 1% chance it would ever catch anything, then sometimes you want to run those nightly just to increase your agility, right? You can merge patches faster because you're not really, uh, your, your probability of there having a problem is not worth running it on and delaying everything by, run, by consuming all the CI cycles on a per patch basis. And so most of the tests, you know, unit tests and things that are short or whatever, then before and on every patch, right? But if they're very time consuming, and gosh, it's found one problem in the last two years, and it runs for you know minutes, then it's probably not worth it, and so we run those afterwards. But otherwise, uh, almost equivalent to what you said on the top, the top bullet and the bottom bullet is what we do, and what John said, so. Maybe, let me just add, like, the, the problem with the every patch is like, some of the things are like, very flaked, like, like KTLS, for example, like, it really depends on like the packets that are coming into KTLS. Maybe there's one like combination that we see, but we never see it very regularly, but we might catch it at nightly. Like if we run for like an hour, maybe every third day or something, we catch it. And you would never run your CI probably for an hour for every patch, right? Like just the cost would be. Um, the question is, who's chasing those failures? Uh, right now they're on my list of to-do things. And <laughs> so, could we add synthetic traffic to the test and then put some of these weirder use cases we find in, into a synthetic test, essentially? I, I mean, I think the answer, like one thing we're looking at right now is like, can we encode these in packet drill? And we've been talking with like some of the Google folks about like, can we get a better packet drill that like builds all of these tests and then runs from CI in sort of strange packet patterns, right, to catch some of this? Um, but I, I, you know, on my to-do list too as well. Um, just uh, well, like one comment regarding the regressions, right? I mean, the K build bot does some of that, but it's maybe not always reliable, or I haven't seen many reports in the past. But it's also like a question of um, how much do you fluctuate, or like how stable is your environment where you actually can run this reliably with those results that you want? Yeah, performance tests, yeah. So the, to Jason's point, right, synthetic workloads are great. The question is, you know, are they uh, fixed? It's always exactly the same synthetic workload, or is there randomization at, like, in a fuzz testing perspective, right? And so there's actually use cases for both of those. And so if there are synthetic ones, and you can treat them as a, you know whether there's going to be a regression because it's predictable and there's, not, there's no uh, flakiness or probabilistic stuff to it. If it's uh, randomly generated, then it's more like a fuzz test, right, where you could have random failures because you suddenly hit a path that's so unlikely, but you finally hit it in the fuzz test, right? And so for uh, that, for any fuzz testing run, the fuzz testing run will output the seed. So you can always reproduce it by putting the same seed back in, even if you were to run the test locally, right? And so you can do the same thing with synthetic uh, network workloads if the randomly generator has some randomness in there. As long as you can output the seed in the wrong, then you can reproduce it, so. Yeah, I, I agree with that. The, the thing uh, with that is if we, like I think most fuzz testing tools that are public have uh, like a corpus where you build it, right? So you have the known set, and then it just starts yeah, yeah. permuting these packets in horribly right. broken ways. Right. So, but the, the seed for the permutation is important to capture to be able to reproduce when there's failures. 
But I mean, I, I would regard this infrastructure mostly for the correctness and to avoid catching regressions. So it's like more about the self-test, but maybe less about the performance stuff, right? So, yeah. So I, I think adding more architecture is definitely super useful, especially your ARM64. Um, and one thing maybe also, uh, like the test BPF dot kernel module. So I think this, at some point, this wasn't my to do, but I never got to it. But I think that would also be useful to run because there are lots of tests that may not be in the self tests themselves. Um, ah, okay. So it also has a battery of, um, like, given it's it's inside the kernel as a kernel module, it's it's mostly testing corner cases around the uh, JITs, right? And uh, there were some guys in the, in the past who added a lot of new tests um, because he was developing the, the MIPS 64 JIT. And right now they're not run as part of the uh, CI. And I would love to see that happening. We can, and we can add it. Right? Yeah, yeah. If, it's, if it's just loading the kernel module, it should be pretty easy to orchestrate. So, so my understanding was, I think it's not supported right now, or like the the kernel module itself. I think you mentioned. Yeah, I think we have limitations of like having external modules. We have like this BPF test mod, but like we can copy paste it and stuff. I think like the it's all doable, but I think we should kind of have like a protocol between the kernel uh, kernel module and the test procs, because like I would integrate everything into test procs, because test procs provides like the most advanced infrastructure. We can blacklist tests, like uh, have only like the relevant error output and all the stuff. We don't want to reinvent that. Like that's a lot of code, lots of logic, mm. a lot of iteration. So, uh, for test, for this module, like we should probably have a test that loads the module and then like, I don't know, maybe calls it like for each test and guess like the results, something like that. So like some simple protocol to do like mm. test at a time and simulate it as a subtest in the test procs. Then it will like be very naturally integrated. Yeah, you could embed the module in like some like in the test probes itself to an init module call, and then then have some parameters that would run one test at a time. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. think test probes already load in something, right, Andre? That's different. That's different. Mm -hmm. have to. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's different module, but I, I mean we have in some infrastructure already that's doing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then BPF preload also we should load it as a module because I I saw some like the files are missing here, so. We, I think we compile it with like yes as the kernel. But we should also compile it with like as module. Note the second line. Maintainers will be not happy, so happy to but to review <laughs> it. <actually. laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> happy. If you're just looking for like low hanging fruit, right? Like we have. <laughs> I think I'm up this week and I'm behind already. Um, but there's like a. There's a lot of tests that are not run because they're not part of test probes, right? Like even if like low hanging fruit would be to take all of those, and some of them were written before test probes even. Again. Like I, I'm like probably the guilty, guiltiest here, right? Like all of the test stock map stuff is done on the side, and we run it in RCI. But like really, that's like those kinds of things should all be moved into I think into test probes, and then they would just naturally be run on both AOU32 and AOU and all the platform stuff. It's like Remember so. Remember that test probes also has like the parallel mode. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. So you probably want to do like the parallel test as well. Like the anyway, there is yeah, maintenance will be review. <laughs> <laughs> <We'll> review. <laughs> so I, I remember you did the, the, the overhaul of the self test framework, right? Like with skeleton and stuff. So. Uh, Samples with you? No, the, 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 in, sel, in te self test test progs, we, we sort of at some point started agreeing on the format in which we write tests and stuff. Is that yeah, yeah, like all those changes to test procs, we rely on them like here. Okay. So like generally, like over the last I don't know two or three years, like we've been consistently moving every well moving or adding everything to test procs. Sometimes we converted existing tests into test procs. There are still lots of them, especially network related data outside, which we let's be honest, we don't run them regularly. I assume, right? Uh, so, so so there are lots of ways to contribute here. Let's say. Got it. Yeah. So lo local CI stuff, right? Like I, I gave a half a shot to it, like bring like with the VM test or SH stuff. Is it going to be like? So I think like this point of like making the CI uh, runnable locally, like it probably will be like taking VM test .sh, trying to reuse like what's possible, and then like somehow wiring it with CI or what I don't know. Like they use the same image, by the way, right? So like okay. VM test downloads the same uh, test image. So it's just more work to like 
put everything together and like make it easy to use. Yeah, so. idea by like running CI locally is that developer who sends a patch can reproduce exactly the same tests that maintainer will see. So if you if something will be failing, you guys will be on the same page uh, on like you know, yeah, for, for to discuss. We talked about like teaching VM test.sh to like either compile or download like Clang and Pajon and all stuff, so that you don't have to preset up your environment. So like, yes. that that direction, right? Like make it completely reproducible sandbox, like, her, like a hermetic uh, sort of thing. Uh, yeah. So Clang has nightly builds, right? That's what we use in CI. Yes. Okay. So this would be like they are semi nightly because sometimes their pipeline is broken, so you have to wait for like a <laughs> but week. It's, but it's still better than like yeah. realizing that for ten hours that you you what what is effectively gone wrong is your Clang version is out of date, and then you recompile Clang. Yeah, so we couldn't afford like building Clang from from sources because like we would be hitting uh, GitHub action timeout. I'm happy to sit with Mikula and like try to add this to VM test or SH while we are here. Awesome. So, let's do that. Perfect. Thank you. Cool. So yeah, guys, if, if you have any ideas or desire to contribute, uh, please, please do. Everyone will benefit from it. Um, and uh, yeah, one, one cool thing is that like, if you will do changes to the CI, we also run tests on, on those changes. So uh, you will be able to see uh, if your change ex ex actually executed properly and what's the effect. So like in this case, I added the kernel config printout just before running the test and I was able to verify it. So it's easy, it, it's not a problem. Any more questions? Awesome. Should we... Um so, like, um, aside from converting existing self-tests that are not running yet in the CI, um, I think one other thing that is also always a mess are the BPF samples. I would just either love to move some of them into the CI, like, or just remove them from the tree. Yes. Delete samples. It's such a mess. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and there's enough somewhere else, like on the internet already, right? There's not even... Yeah, when you take the good ones and put them on like gpf.io, it's like, here's a sample program that's probably good. That I think we should discuss like as a, as a, as a separate topic in itself. We were, we were, we, we always bring this up, right? This is the program type. These are the, this is what this program can do. This is how you can do with that program. Some, some sort of like a drop list, like documentation on ebpf.io would be nice. And this will be a nice place for samples. But Sam, like there are two places in the kernel. I generally tell people who start with BPF, just look at self-tests, right? It explains like how stuff works. So, yeah, for me as well, I recently started working with the BPF. I feel sample is pretty good I mean, for for the test. But they have tied the whole test right infrastructure. You have to know the, how they works. I feel it's a bit more complicated than the samples. For sample, it's more standalone. I mean, we can move to somewhere else, but I think it's good to. I could keep it somewhere, maybe a link in the documentation somewhere. I think we can only guarantee uh, that self-tests will be working, right? Because I'm pretty sure that samples, that some of them are not running anymore because like, some things change, right? And, but proc tests, they, we are giving them some love <laughs> constantly, right? So they are runnable. So like with samples, like they are usually written as like a demo application that does something, not like really testing very fine. So like converting them to self-test is really like just kind of writing the tests from the scratch. So like if we are doing something about them, like let's just remove. But I think like the, the problem with samples that especially noobs don't realize, right? That you have this nice condition where like you're compiling samples with your current uh, kernel, right? Which is like completely unrealistic for anything but networking, let's say, right, usually. And uh, it's just like not a really good representation of how you would do like the BPF application in real life. So it's good maybe for starting, but like we can also extract it in a separate repository as like a samples. Like libpf, we have like libpf bootstrap for some simple tracing applications. So like we can have something like that or extend bootstrap, whatever, I don't know. Uh, but like we can keep it separate. I totally agree. 
And what I like, for I mean, it's pro it probably takes a bit to build, but what I like is when you go, for example, to the to the Golang page, you have you have executable samples in your documentation, and I would love to have something like this maybe for I don't know ebpf.io, and that's maybe a starting point where users could play around. But like the yeah, the samples in the kernel they might be misleading in in terms of like where to start and and how to start with things. Yeah. Like as I said, we have maybe people bootstrap for like U probe example, K probe example, stuff like that, like minimal core stuff. It takes a long time and a lot of effort to maintain all that, so like it doesn't grow. Uh, so you know, like you'll need some active involvement, like if you want to maintain this as a collection, a, like a big collection of simple examples. So we'll need to figure out how we want to go about this, but this should be community effort, not. So part of this, this discussion overlaps with uh, my last slide, which talked about CI/CD for libbpf, um, and where you'd want uh, simple libbpf programs, and I mean programs both from the eBPF program sense as well as from the user land application that consumes it, right? And so um, I see a lot of analogies here. It's just not just about testing, you know, the kernel per se. It's about how do you develop samples and make it easier for developers to write programs with libbpf, and for that, you'd say, well, for at least for those, you'd want some of those to be cross-plat, right? At least that's part of my goal, right? And so where do we put those? And at least, like, ebpf.io is a nice place that could be a cross-plat set of samples and things, and you can have some samples that might be Linux-specific, some that are Windows-specific, and some that are cross-plat, right? And we'd have to have, have a way of, of categorizing them so that people would know what to look for, uh, labeling. So. But otherwise, yeah, let's do it. Cool. Awesome. Thanks a lot.